Absolutely. So, Mr. Doris, can you explain the role that local government has played in economic development? And how do you think uh, change will be needed amidst the COVID-19 pandemic? Or how do you see this role changing in the future? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Gibbs. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think uh, local governments um, play such a significant role, right? I mean, from the practical licensing of the business itself to the permitting, um, to make sure that you uh, have the proper uh, operations in place, um, the inspections, all those things. Um, and then you have sort of workforce development and training, which I think is important. So, and, and I will go even further to say um, the educational systems, right? And mm -hmm. incentive programs that we do have um, that also supports entrepreneurship, right? Um, and doing, uh, you know, and doing COVID, I think um, it caused the city to really look aggressively at different types of solutions because the problems were coming so fast at us and we have to really rethink a lot of ways that we were interacting with the entrepreneurship space. You know, normally we, we sort of like, here are all the supports, uh, you go get it. And, you know, we kind of let the, the businesses do what they do, right? Uh, but we had to be more proactive because we have real needs and we have to literally step in and say, we need, we have uh, supply chain challenges with PPE, for instance, uh, you know, personal protective equipment, right? Um, we need to make sure that we find some businesses who can work with us which we can manufacture on the spot, right? So there's some adapt adaptability that those businesses needed. And when they needed an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, they, they could not have continued doing what they were doing because the, the city needed them. And so because of the supply chain issues that we had um, and all the challenges when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the, the, the health crisis that we were facing, uh, we sort of went ahead and worked particularly with our Economic Development Corporation, the mayor, our office, working with entrepreneurs um, to really uh, shift some of what they do and to create the, the products that, that we need. Um, I'll also say that, you know, generally some, um, you know, some of this uh, can't happen in a regular construct because there's not a guaranteed customer at the end of it, right? And then you have sort of pricing issues and challenges because um, you know some of the larger firms who do this they manufacture overseas. But when there's a supply chain issue and you can't get a, a product from overseas, you got to build it locally, and you've got to make it locally. And so uh, you know they were able to do that because local government stepped in and we became the customer. And because we became the customer, those businesses were able to make the adjustments and also be. Uh, you know, um, uh, entrepreneurial in, in, in that case. The last thing I'll say is what we also found that uh, we needed to step in to look at the various business models that are out there. Um, and, and, and they're, you know, the, the traditional business model is great. Sort of profit-driven business model, the business model with a singular owner or a few owners or a board, et cetera, good. But we started to look at, you know, worker cooperatives as an option. We have found that, um, the shared ownership model there, those businesses were vying more in this economy. And so another thing that gov uh, government did, what we stepped in and provide programs and services to convert businesses uh, from, um, from uh, sort of one or two owners uh, to actually employees owning those businesses and provide resources uh, to help those businesses uh, do that transaction. And so uh, it was a series of things that happened and we were able to do that were uh, pretty successful, um, but certainly playing a much more active and direct role in the, you know, sort of um, forming and moving the market in the direction it needed to go because we had such great need. Thank you, Mr. Doris. Are there any questions you have for me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Dr. Gibbs, we were talking a little bit about entrepreneurship education and um, a lot about it. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm thinking about um, has entrepreneurship education in the classroom, right? Because you know, we're on a practitioner side. We're, mm -hmm. we're working with small businesses every day, entrepreneurs every day. Um, has it kept up pace with innovation outside the classroom? And how uh, do or does higher education, sorry, institutions keep up? Um, with ever, the ever-changing sort of entrepreneurship uh, and entrepreneurial landscape. 
Sure. So that's a that's an excellent question. Um, I would say of all of the business disciplines that are uh, a part of a business school, accounting, marketing, finance, management, uh, and then of course entrepreneurship or operations, supply chain. Entrepreneurship has been a leader in keeping pace with innovation and technology outside of the classroom, primarily because uh, diffusion of innovation in our field is relatively rapid. Uh, we are all constantly educating each other on new technologies, new approaches, new trends, such as lean startup or design thinking or business model generation. Uh, at our conferences, we are regularly visited by uh, software firms who have new technologies for us to utilize in our classrooms. And as a, a former board member and a member of uh, the USASB organization, uh, we regularly share new techniques and approaches with one another uh, as we go to those conferences. Uh, and that may be hardware or software. Uh, uh, if you've heard of the owl cam uh, cameras that people are using now, uh, we started using those a while back in, at the USASB conference to show how you might want to connect entrepreneurs who are uh, far away using this uh, camera technique. Uh, I would say from a higher education perspective, uh, typically higher education moves relatively slow, like a brontosaurus type movement. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they regularly see demands from students saying, hey, we need this new technology. The faculty mm -hmm. will bring forward uh, new demands and technology. And also some of their crediting bodies will require them to introduce technology in classrooms in a way that benefits students. And uh, the most recent example I can say is analytics, which is now required in all accounting classrooms for those who are AACSB accredited. Students have to learn languages such as R and Python in order to keep pace uh, with uh, demand from the accrediting bodies. The, the third area is employers themselves. Employers regularly approach uh, yeah. entrepreneurship educators and higher education institutions and ask them, can you please teach students these skills because we need it in the marketplace. So there's multiple ways. Uh, and having said that, I have another question for you, Mr. Doris, if you don't mind. <laughs> and that is, uh, how does the city of New York work with entrepreneurship educators or others to promote underrepresented or disadvantaged entrepreneurship, economic growth and economic development? Well, yeah, well, look, that is uh, what I would think um, I, I would consider one of my, my expertise and in, 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 in what I sort of uh, say is sort of my purpose in, in life at this moment, because, you know, I, I mentioned some of the statistics and uh, being an entrepreneur of color, uh, immigrant entrepreneur, um, kind of living through that experience of being denied my, my first business loan uh, for no real reason. <laughs> because I had to go to a CDFI and then I received, you know, I got my first bit of snow from a CDFI and not, not, a, not the bank I've been banking with for years um, and the challenges that they face. So there, there are capital challenges. There's um, sort of um, issues with, with networks uh, that these entrepreneurs face. Uh, they, they don't have the sort of the broad network um, and, uh, you know, the challenge around capacity. And, and, and are they able to sort of, uh, you know, meet their orders that they need, need and get the workers that they need and, and, and sort of um, be able to move their business in the right direction. So we created uh, several programs that are, you know, specifically address um, a, a lot of those issues and challenges, particularly for underrepresented businesses. So, for instance, we have a, a women entrepreneurship program in five years, worked with 17,000 women across the city as entrepreneurs and was able to uh, set those businesses up. Uh, some of them were small businesses, others were sort of entrepreneur ventures, as you mentioned, sort of high growth industry tech uh, and so and the like, um, bringing actual products to market and helping them facilitate that those transactions. Um, and then, of course, our, our sort of uh, uh, staple program, the Minority Women Owned Business Program, uh, which was actually started under Mayor David Dinkins. 
than it was stopped for two decades, by the way. I mean, can you imagine that? Two decades in a city that's majority minority, the minority women-owned business program was not operative. And so when this mayor came and we sort of start to re we had to rebuild it essentially from scratch, um, and that's when we started the, the Office of Minority Women-Owned Business, codified it into the city charter, or that's the city's constitution. That means it will never go away. And they will always have to staff it and there will always have to be people there. And we set goals, big goals. Um, you know, 30% of the city's uh, uh, program uh, spend uh, procurement dollars need to go to at least to minority women-owned businesses. It should be more. Um, but as we build capacity. So with that program, we built, uh, uh, you know, dozens of capacity building programs, but one I'm particularly proud of because it came out of my experience uh, as a small business. Uh, going to my bank, as I mentioned, getting denied. So any business now that it does work with the city of New York um, and you're an MWBE, uh, you can get up to a million dollars from us at 3% interest rate. And during the pandemic, we dropped it to 0%. Um, to do that work. So, you know, uh, I got a loan eventually, but my loan was, uh, and I, I don't like to say it too much because uh, people just shiver, but for me at that time, it was a lot, 9.9% interest rate. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I just gave it back after like a few months because it was just cutting into my profit margin and it was not making any sense for me. So we created a program uh, to help those, uh, you know, underserved businesses who are struggling, who are, you know, three times of likely to be denied by a bank um, and, and give them the resources to actually execute on the work that we're giving them. And so that's up to a million dollars at 3%. And so I think that is so, so important um, that we have programs like these at that level uh, to support these types of businesses. Um, uh, I'm gonna jump in and um, there are two, there are some questions in the chat and I wanna pose this one and I think it's probably best posed to you or Commissioner, um, it's from uh, uh, Stephen who asks, I have a business idea and I'm currently working on the business plan for it. What would be my next step if I'm trying to secure a business loan? And my second question is for, uh, uh, is there loans available for minority retired service members? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the beautiful thing about the Department of Small Business Services, um, you know, before I got there and, you know, we made, it was there and it was available, but then we had made some adjustments and expanded our reach when I was there uh, and just recently left. Um, you can go to any of their uh, business solution centers. We have five, five across the, the city and two industrial business solution centers. Um, and they will assist you and get, first of all, completing your uh, business plan and, and, and making sure that it's, it's good, it's legit, it has all the pieces that you need to so have someone working with you one-on-one. -on -one. And then from that, you also have uh, opportunity for you to get a, uh, uh, to sign up for a loan uh, that is um, sort of uh, comparable, right, to you and makes sense for you. Uh, we generally do about 65 million to $75 million a year annually with those types of transactions. So really helping small businesses find loans um, and helping them uh, find sort of low interest loans uh, and be able to, to help them. Uh, during the pandemic, we went a little further. We started to buy down the interest because we found that there's a liquidity problem in, uh, for, for our small businesses and entrepreneurs. And so we started to buy down the interest of those loans, existing loans that they have, right? And so that if it was, you know, they were like me, it was nine, eight percent, some twelve percent. We we bought it down uh, to uh, to uh, I think three or three percent or so um, for them, and so that they were able to, um, you know, uh, take some of that money and some of them got it to zero percent and take some of that money and actually put it back into their business. And so we're using different strategies, but yes, there's uh, you go to the SBS website. Um, we'll try to get it in the chat. You can definitely go there and uh, some. And we have a hotline too um, that you can call. We set that up during the pandemic. Uh, when I left, about 75,000 businesses have called that hotline and but over the two years and we're able to help them with this exact same issues uh, that you mentioned. Okay, um, there, Dr. There's, there's another question and, um, and you mentioned something about solo entrepreneurs earlier. So I'm gonna ask this here. And what would be the best way for them to network and advertise their services? I'm assuming when it comes to uh, government uh, sort of related uh, 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 support. 
Yeah, I would say that uh, the SBS uh, Minority and Women-Owned Business Directory is good for you. Um, also, we have if you are a minority or women-owned business, um, that is where not only all 70 entities in the city, the states, you know, 100 or so entities, uh, and all the private sector partners, which are in the hundreds that we work with, uh, they go there. Uh, to find qualified minority women-owned businesses. And that's a great place to advertise it. So we advise everybody to get certified or sign up. We also have, if you don't want to be an MWBE certified firm, there's also uh, various lists that we add you to on our website. For instance, if you are, uh, you know, you are a minority women-owned or a firm just that specializes in a particular area, there are directories on the website there that you can get your name added to. Um, and also a map that is on those on the website that uh, can add it to so help you market. And lastly, uh, uh, EDC, uh, Economic Development Corporation, also helps uh, businesses to um, uh, in market themselves. And we provide uh, resources to help you also market um, uh, your business and, and connect you with opportunities, which is a huge part of what we do uh, at SBS. Great. Uh, for those who have, uh, we started to see a lot of chat <laughs> questions in the chat. Unfortunately, I'll put time. Uh, I would share those questions with the two of you and ask that if you could give uh, some written response and we'll get back to those. But at this last question, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Gibbs. I, I, I'll, Gibbs yes, please. I've got a question for Dr. Gibbs too. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're running real close on time, so I'll allow okay. One, okay. one question from you uh, and then one question from the audience and uh, before we'd have to move on. Yes, Dr. Gibbs or? I just wanted to, to add a, a little bit to what Mr. Doris said about advertising your business. As a solo entrepreneur, if uh, you aren't trying to provide services to government entities, uh, but it's to other regular businesses or consumers, uh, learn as much as you can about those uh, potential customers or clients and then leave information about your business in the places that they frequent. So if they go to the bank, you should leave your business card at the bank or a brochure that has information with your website on it. Mm -hmm. If they go to Home Depot, ask the managers there if you can leave uh, a brochure on the boards or near the registers where people can gain access to your information. So the more you learn about your customers, the easier it will be to advertise your, your products and services to them. With this, I'm going to give uh, the commissioner the last question for those who have asked questions in the chat. Uh, certainly make sure that you visit with one of our entrepreneurs uh, who will be talking later uh, today uh, to get some more specific sort of indications of how uh, they may have done that. And again, I will ask uh, both the uh, commissioner and uh, Dr. Gibbs to respond to questions I'm asked. Uh, uh, commissioner, you have the last question. Yeah, sure, Dr. Gibbs. Um, wow, it's been an amazing discussion and it just feels like it just evaporated, right? <laughs> um, it's so fast. Um, can you sure. speak, uh, you know, sort of, uh, and I think this is important, uh, around the importance of entrepreneurship, I, uh, entrepreneur education, really of having both practitioners and academics together in a classroom setting or a training session. Um, and how does this approach uh, spur innovation and creative thinking? Sure. So uh, oftentimes entrepreneurship educators, depending on who the person is, have a theoretical background and they are very interested in research and advancing the field from a research perspective, whereas practitioners have a background of, of having actually practiced entrepreneurship or intrapreneurship in their previous uh, businesses or uh, workplaces, and they bring that, that practical real world experience directly into the classroom where students can learn vicariously through their experiences or where they're brought in as speakers. This encourages students to uh, have the confidence of being able to achieve entrepreneurial success by having those role models directly in the classroom and getting provided multiple perspectives as well. So, and, and they'll, they'll know the latest and greatest trends and practices. So that will allow students to be more innovative because they're being introduced to that on a regular basis from the practitioner side. 
Oh, well, well, thank you for that response. I will certainly say that is taking place here at SBS with a mixture of our um, scholars and our practitioners uh, dealing with our students in the classroom. I can't thank you enough for such a rich uh, conversation. I'm sure our audience uh, learn a lot and we will be reaching out with responses that have gone uh, unanswered at this particular time, but I hope that there was a great takeaway uh, in light uh, of that.